happy Monday, everybody. Um, I'm just sitting here waiting. Here we go. It is Monday morning. I hope everybody had a terrific uh, Palm Sunday. It was quiet around here. It's probably quiet most places. So I'm just that. Ah, there's one set of eyes. Pam is here. Good morning. All right, we've got a few people here. Um, oh goodness, I have to tell you, I had a rough weekend, you know, and it's funny, I am very much affected by the weather. Uh, I had been planning on Saturday being really beautiful and I had had a whole plan where we were just gonna go for a drive and it would be pretty and we'd have some scenery and then we were gonna planning on like having a long walk and my husband, opened the drapes and there was snow like everywhere it was so discouraging it really was i had to kind of you know take hold of myself and uh but you know we're here it also didn't help that little showgirl here hang on a second hold on i'm coming right back showgirl who you've met before was not doing well she says hi and she hi baby and she had to go to the vet on Friday, but she's doing much better now. So we're very happy about that. Anyway, today's digital resource is, I'm saying it again, mariebostwick.com backslash blog. My blog has a really terrific idea for, <clears throat> I mean, I think it's terrific. Somebody's got to say it, um, for an Easter brunch board. So, you know, Easter may be a little different than last year and then other years, but it should still be a very special holiday. And um, take a look at my ideas for Easter brunch board for your upcoming Easter. Can you believe Easter is like in less than a week? I don't know. On the one hand, time is flying. And on the other hand, it is holding still. Okay, let's get reading. We are in a single thread chapters 26 and 27. I have to warn you guys, this is probably going to be the final week. We're getting closer to the end of the book. Um, but we've been having fun together, haven't we? So, all right, let's read. Chapter 26, Abigail Burgess Wynn. As Evelyn suggested, Margot and I started on the east side of town. Her Volkswagen was cramped, but I was glad Margot was driving. As I've gotten older, I found it hard to drive after dusk. Also, distressed as I was, I wasn't really sure I'd be able to focus on driving. It was probably for the best. Margot hadn't lived in New Bern for long and needed me to navigate. Together, we made a good team. Margot was very encouraging, echoing El Evelyn's assertions that since Liza had run off so quickly with no car, no money, and no plan, we would surely be able to find her very soon. After all, the only hours had passed since she'd bolted. The cold weather and the blanket of snow covering the ground would have made it difficult to walk very quickly. Chances are she was still within a five-mile radius of New Bern. I sat up straight and peered out the window, eagerly searching the sidewalks and roadsides for any glimpse of Liza, giving Margot directions when she needed them, and keeping one ear tuned for the ring of Margot's cellular telephone. Evelyn and Margot had agreed to call each other the minute they spotted Liza. But as minutes and then an hour passed and dusk became night without any sign of her or any message from Evelyn, my despair deepened. It's so dark. She was wearing that black jacket she likes and of course her black jeans and those awful black boots. We could be driving right past her and not see her. We'd see her in the headlights, Margot assured me. With all this drifted snow, she'd have to stay close to the road. Come on, Abigail, you've got to think positively. We're going to find her soon. And if we don't, Evelyn will, you'll see. Margot was saying all the right words, but she, I wasn't convinced she entirely believed them. We drove in silence for a long time. My stomach rumbled. It was well past dinner time, and I remembered now that I hadn't had any lunch, but I didn't say anything about being hungry. The only thing I cared about now was finding Liza. I looked at my watch. It was nearly nine o'clock. Where can she be? Oh, Margo, this is my fault. Everything. We're not going to find her, and even if we do, I know she'll never, ever be able to forgive me. Margot glanced away from the road briefly, quickly turning her head to look at me. Her eyes were full of compassion, 
and somehow that only made me feel worse. I didn't deserve her pity. Abigail, don't say that. Yes, it is true. You've made some terrible mistakes, but you're only human. If you tell Liza how truly sorry you are and try to explain why you've acted the way you have, she'll forgive you. How could she? I've abandoned her, and what's worse, I abandoned Susan, my own sister. I sighed. How can I expect Liza to forgive me? I was never able to forgive her mother. Susan hurt me so badly, and I was never, ever able to forgive her for what she'd done. Margot, you go to church a lot, don't you, since you were a little girl? She nodded. I've always been a church member, written checks and showed up at services every once in a while, but I never attended regularly, not until recently. A couple of weeks ago, the minister was preaching on the Lord's Prayer, the part about asking God to forgive our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. I paused, waiting for Margaret to say something, to give some verse or, or judgment on the subject, but she just kept her eyes on the road and listened. When you hear something like that, that you can only be forgiven if you've been willing to forgive? I didn't have a handkerchief or tissue with me, so I wiped my eyes on the edge of my sleeve as I thought of Susan on that day when I told her I would never forgive her and never wanted to see her again. It's too late now, I whispered to myself. She's gone. It's too late. No, it's not, Margot said. It's never too late to forgive someone else, just as it's never too late to ask for forgiveness. I looked at her skeptically. Margot was sweet and well-intentioned, and I had come to admire the genuineness of her faith. In fact, the strength of her faith was part of why I'd gone back to church. She seemed so happy and at peace, even when things weren't going well. I hoped that a little of what she'd found there would rub off on me. But I was beginning to think she'd spent too much time watching those Sunday morning programs hosted by those preachers with the blow-dried hair and the southern accents. My problem couldn't be resolved by repeating the Lord's Prayer and promising to try harder next time. Margot, that's easy to say, but you don't understand. What went on between my sister and me was just so incredibly awful. It was beyond awful. What Susan did to me was unforgivable, and I gave it right back to her. Kept my promise never to have anything to do with her, not even after I knew she was dying of cancer. And that was worse than unforgivable. Abigail, my mother always said that there is no pit so deep that the love and forgiveness of God is not deeper still. <sighs> Margo was trying to help, but inwardly I was rolling my eyes at this platitude. Sure, it was easy for someone like Margo or her mother, or people who probably thought that jaywalking as a, as a for, people who probably thought of jaywalking as a form of civil rebellion. They couldn't possibly understand what I was dealing with years and years of selfishness, betrayal, and deceit. And I wasn't just talking about me. Lies and duplicity were part of the Burgess family legacy. By comparison, Margot's family probably looked like the Brady Bunch. I sighed, and as if reading my unspoken thoughts, Margot went on. Abigail, I don't know all the details of what happened between you and your sister. I don't need to. Sure, maybe if I knew the whole story, I would feel that both of you were beyond the possibility of pardon, but fortunately, I'm not in charge of forgiving anyone or anything. This is between you and God, not you and me, not even you and Susan. When we sin against someone else, yes, we are wronging them, but we are also wronging God, and that's even worse. Susan may have deserved some of your anger, but God never did. She pulled up at a four-way stop and looked both ways before crossing through the intersection. Her eyes were still on the road as she continued talking. The thing is, we're all in the pit at some point in our lives. Some people are able to climb out and some never do. The ones who climb out are the ones who recognize their need for help, have the humility to grab hold of the rope and faith to believe that the rope is strong enough to lift them up. I was quiet for a moment thinking. When I'd first met Margot, she was so happy and smiling all the time that I'd honestly thought she wasn't all that bright. I'm embarrassed to admit it now, but it's true. Most smart people I knew, the intellectuals, were brooding and miserable and forever bemoaning the deplorable state of the world and, all, and the dumbing down of our national standards and everything from political discourse to musical theater. They had all kinds of opinions on all kinds of subjects but I'd rarely seen any of them do anything besides complain. As far as they were concerned, the world was bad and getting worse, and anyone who thought there was anything to be done about it was a fool. Margot, on the other hand, 
was the kind of person who, once she recognized a problem, immediately started searching for solutions. I'd noticed that very often she found them. Sweet temper and girlish giggles notwithstanding, Margot was clearly a very intelligent woman. My brooding philosoph philosopher friends, that Greek chorus of hopelessness, would have scoffed at the simplicity of her illustration, but I also knew if I'd asked them how to get out of the pit, they'd have had nothing more to offer than conferring nods and the brilliant observation that it was certainly a complicated issue. Margot was an intelligent woman, and it was clear that somehow or other she'd found a piece that I hadn't. But still, it was a complicated issue. Margot, I know you mean well, but you make it sound easy and it's not. The whole thing started before Liza was born, even before you were born. There's been so much water under the bridge. So much went wrong. At this point, I wouldn't even know how to begin to make it right. Sure you do, Abigail. Your minister told you exactly how to begin with forgiveness. Even though she's gone, you can choose to forgive Susan. Once you've done that, you can ask God for, for, to forgive you. She turned her eyes away from the darkened robe to give me a quick smile. And he will, Abigail. And Liza, I asked, will she forgive me too? Well, that's the one thing in all this that isn't your choice, Margot said, squinting a little as a car with its brights on approached and she flashed her high beams at it. Maybe she will, and maybe she won't. Deep down, in spite of all that she's been through, Liza has a good heart, but there are no guarantees. One thing I know for sure, she never will if you don't ask. I was tired. I let my head drop back against the headrest and closed my eyes for a moment. Margot had given me a lot to think about. At my age, was it possible to change? To make things right again? Maybe. But none of that would matter if I couldn't find Liza. Where could she be? With my eyes still closed, I said a silent prayer. God, I know there really isn't any reason for you to listen to me tonight. I haven't done a very good job of listening to you these past 62 years, so a part of me feels kind of hypocritical coming to you after all this time. I wouldn't blame you a bit if you ignored me, but I pray you won't. Margot says I have to forgive Susan so that you can forgive me, and I want to. I'm just not sure I can, not unless you help me. Please, dear Lord, help me. I've always thought of myself as so strong, but I'm not strong enough for this. I just can't do it alone anymore, and I don't want to. Help me. And God, about Liza, I'm so worried about her, and I can't find her. I don't know much about you, God, but I do know that you know where she is. Please help me find her. Help her to come home and forgive me. Amen. Just as the amen was forming in my mind, I heard the tinny, computerized chirp of Margot's cell phone. My eyes flew open, and I turned in my seat to face Margot as she flipped her phone and held it to her ear. It's Evelyn. God heard my prayer and helped her find Liza. And it was Evelyn. When I raised my eyebrows, silently questioning Margot as to the identity of the caller and mutely mouthed, Evelyn, Margot responded with a grin and a quick nod. Hi, Evelyn, where are you? Did you find her? The expectant mile, smile on Margot's face faded. Oh, no, we haven't either. No, not a sign. She was quiet for a moment, listening. Me too. It's so cold out there. I'm worried. We really don't have a choice. Another moment of silence, a quick glance in my direction. She's sitting right here. All right. Wait just a minute. Margot took the telephone away from her ear and gave it to me. Here, she wants to ask you something. That is chapter 26. I'm going to get, so if you, the jingling you hear in the background, my mother's cat has moved in and she has a little jingle on her collar. So she's walking around, she's joined the party today. All right, my friends, you ready for chapter 27? Me too, let's go. Chapter 27, Evelyn Dixon. After a couple of hours of driving up and down every street in town, looking for Liza in every likely spot, I decided it was time to change tactics and look in the unlikely spots. That's when I decided to call Margot and Abigail. It was painful ground to cover, but when Abigail got on the line, I asked her several questions about Susan and Liza, their life together, and the circumstances surrounding Susan's death. 
It occurred to me that perhaps Liza had headed out of the house, headed to the house she shared with her mother, or some other place that reminded her of her old life. It was just a hunch, but I had to try something soon. We didn't speak of it to Abigail, but Margot was in agreement with me. If we couldn't find Liza by morning, we would have to convince Abigail to file a missing persons report. Neither of us wanted to see Liza end up in front of a judge, but with the temperature so bitter and Liza having disappeared with no money, it seemed we had no choice. After we talked, Abigail put Margot back on the line. Margot, I'm heading over here. I'm going to head over to Stanford. Maybe Liza is trying to get back home. It's too far for her to have walked, but maybe she had some extra cash in her pocket that Abigail didn't know about and caught a train. She might even have tried to hitchhike. Oh, I hope not. You never know who might have, probably remembering that Abigail was sitting right next to her and not wanting to alarm her. Margot didn't finish the sentence. Anyway, that sounds like a good idea. Now, what do you want us to do? Well, I guess you'd better just keep driving around town. Maybe she's still there and we just missed her. You should probably go back to Abigail's and check there. Maybe she calmed down and came home on her own. All right. Did you go by the shop? Maybe she went there. Good point. You have a key, don't you? Could you drive by and see if she's there? I'm going to start driving south. No problem. Abigail and I will head over there right now. I'll leave my phone on. Call me if you find her. I will. You do the same. Thanks, Margot. It had started snowing again, and the roads were terrible. It was well past midnight when I got to the address Abigail had given me, the townhouse that Liza had shared with her mother. I'd been praying during the entire drive, asking God to let Liza be <coughs> excuse me, sitting on the doorstep of her old home, but she wasn't. Next, I drove around the neighborhood, through the downtown area, past Liza's old school, and finally past the hospital where Abigail and Susan had died, where Abigail said Susan had died but there was no sign of Liza. Finally, I checked in with the others and we decided to call it a night. Margo was going to drive back to Abigail's house and sleep there. We were all still hoping that Liza would turn up on her own. I was going to head back to her place, to my, to my place, grab a couple hours of sleep and then be back at Abigail's by 7.30. If Liza hadn't come home by then, we would consider calling the police. Snow was falling even harder as I headed back to New Bern. Fat flakes drove toward my windshield with a constant, monotonous force that gave me the feeling of being trapped on a conveyor belt and surrounded by a continually rotating image of snowfall, running as fast as I could but getting nowhere. I was tired. It took all my concentration to focus on driving through the whirling snow. About 10 miles from home, the storm subsided and I started thinking about Liza again. Where could she be? I went over it all in my mind, trying to think of every possible place she might have gone, but nothing new came to mind. Logically, I knew I had done everything I could, and my exhausted body craved the comfort of my bed and a few hours rest, but my mind was still uneasy. It's just so frustrating, I thought. I've spent half the night looking for Liza, driven across the whole state, and I've reached a dead end. A dead end. That was it. The New Bern exit was coming up on my right, but I stepped on the gas and flew past it, heading farther north toward Winthrop, a sleepy village just a few miles from the Massachusetts border. I'd never been there before, but if I could find Winthrop, I'd find Liza. I was sure of it. The gates were open, but the wind had pillowed the snow into drifts. I didn't want to risk getting stuck in the unplowed road, so I pulled my car up in front of the cemetery and parked. Getting out of the car, I saw that the snow wasn't quite as pristine as it had appeared on first glance. Someone had tromped a trail through the front gates of the cemetery and down the road, past the ancient crumbling headstone so battered by wind, weather, and time that it was impossible anymore to know who was buried beneath them only that those who lay sleeping there had once been beloved of someone. I followed the footsteps, first through a grove of evergreen trees shrouded with an icy blanket of snow that glittered in the first light of morning, into the newer sections of the cemetery, where those who had known this life in the 19th and 20th centuries rested awaiting the clarion call to a new world, 
and finally to a small plot set apart, surrounded by a short wrought iron fence to a gray marble crypt that bore the name of Burgess. Liza, dressed all in black, stood in front of the crypt with her head bowed. The snow muffled my steps. She hadn't heard me coming. Liza, the fence gate squeaked as I opened it and stepped into the Burgess family plot. Liza turned around. Her eyes were red from crying and there were dark circles under them. She didn't ask how I'd found her. Sweetie, are you all right? You must be freezing. We're also worried about you, especially Abigail. I'm sure. Her voice lacked the smug sarcasm Liza so often used when referring to her aunt, but there was a flatness, a hopelessness to her tone that was even more disturbing. I came up alongside her and read the inscription on the stone. Susan Catherine Burgess, born June 26, 1950, died September 20, 2005. Susan's tomb did not declare that she was a beloved mother, but she was. It was written in her daughter's eyes. How she missed her. I put my arm around Liza's waist. Her eyes were fixed on the crypt, but I could feel her body relax a little as she leaned into me. Tell me about her. She was my mother, Liza said simply. She took care of me. She made sure I did my homework and cleaned my room. She told me she loved me all the time, and sometimes when I messed up, she yelled at me. Usually I deserved it, so I didn't mind that much. She worked really hard because I don't have a dad. I mean, I have a dad, but he bailed out before I was born. Liza shrugged. I don't even know who he is. Mom had to pay the bills all by herself, and sometimes she was really tired. But every Sunday was our day together. She always got up and made a big breakfast pancakes or waffles or something, and then we'd do something together, something inexpensive, like go to the park or winter shopping or some free concert she'd read about. Liza smiled a little as she remembered. Some of those concerts were pretty awful. <laughs> Once in February, when it was cold and miserable and there was just nothing to do, the only thing she found in the paper was an accordion recital at the Moose Lodge. Have you ever been to an accordion recital? I shook my head. Well, you aren't missing anything. And it just went on and on. Mom kept making this goofy face at me and kind of bouncing in her seat, you know, like she was about to break out and start doing a polka or something. I just about choked trying not to burst out laughing, but that was Mom. She could make anything fun. She sounds like a wonderful mother. You were lucky. Yeah, Liza whispered. I was lucky. For a while, I was. She was the only person I could always count on. At least I thought she could. And then a tear seeped from the corner of her eye as she stared at the tomb. Now I've got nobody. Nobody like your mother. There will never be anyone like her, but you're not as alone as you think, Liza. And there are a lot of people who care about you. Margot and I and your Aunt Abigail, she cares about you, Liza, much more than you realize. Liza's lips flattened into a thin line of disgust. disgust. She doesn't care about me. She puts on a good show, but she doesn't care about anyone but herself. That's not true, and it's not fair. Finally, looking up at me, Liza's eyes flashed, and she started to protest, but I wouldn't let her interrupt. Listen to me. I know she hasn't always been the easiest person to live with, but she's changed. And the way she treated you and your mother was... Well, it was despicable. I know that because she told me all about it, and that's the word she used to describe her behavior. Liza furrowed her brow, listening but not able to completely believe what I was saying. So she told you about Mom and me, about why I'm living with her? I nodded. She told me everything. A flush of color rose in Liza's cheeks. I suppose she was embarrassed that I knew about her run-in with the law. Liza, don't worry about it. I don't think any less of you. What you did wasn't right, but sometimes when people are laboring under the weight of a terrible grief, when they're suffering and in pain, they do things they normally wouldn't. That doesn't mean they're bad people, even if sometimes they act like they are. I paused for a moment before going on. You may not believe it, but 
Abigail really has changed, truly. She realizes what she's done and she's sorry. She wants another chance. She wants to make things right between you. She wants you to come home. She does? Well, how nice for her. Liza let out one bitter laugh. Isn't that just her all over? Abigail wants another chance. Abigail wants me to come home. Abigail, Abigail, it's always about her. Not this time. Abigail, sorry. Well, I'm sorry, but I really don't give a damn what she wants. And I'm not going back. She pulled away from me, turned and started to walk toward the gate that separated the Burgess family plot from the others. I reached out and grabbed her arm. Liza, wait a minute. This isn't about Abigail. It's about you. She is your only living relative, your only surviving link with your mother. Whether you know it or like it or not, you need Abigail. No, I don't, Liza shouted as she spun around to face me again. Angry tears filled her eyes. I don't need anybody. You can't trust people. They always let you down. They always leave. I nodded. I know about that. It's true, Liza. Sometimes the people who are supposed to love you most let you down. My husband left me. After 28 years, he decided he didn't love me anymore. And it hurt, Liza. It hurt so badly that I wanted to close myself up in a box and hide. I didn't want to risk being hurt again. For months and months, I just cut myself off from everyone. I sat at my kitchen table and cried and felt sorry for myself. I stayed there for a long, long time. But eventually, I realized I had to get up and move on. I had to. Even if it meant that I'd fail or get hurt again, Liza, everything that makes life worth living, finding love, finding our dreams, trying to make them come true is risky. But we can't do any of those things alone. It took me a long time to realize that, but it's true. Liza's breath was coming out in short, frozen bursts and her chest rose and fell heavily as she tried to calm herself. I took a step nearer. I think that's what Abigail is realizing. You might not believe it, but I think you should come home and find out for yourself. You and your Aunt Abigail are very much alike, and you're about to fall into the same pit that she's been trapped in all these years. You're gonna cut yourself off from everything that matters, from family, friends, and any possibility of finding love or happiness, all because you were afraid of getting hurt again. You say you hate Abigail, but you're about to make the same mistakes that she has. Come back with me, Liza. Listen to what Abigail has to say. Not for her sake, but for your own. I don't know if I can, Liza whispered. It hurts so much. She lifted her head and looked at the frozen graveyard, at the rows and rows of stone markers surrounding us. Sometimes I just want it to be over. Her eyes were so weary, so sad, eyes too old for such a young face. My heart broke for her. I know. There are times when I felt that way too. Just like you, I wanted to give up, but I'm glad I didn't. If I had, I'd never have met you. And that's not something I would have wanted to miss. We're not meant to live alone, Liza. Everybody needs somebody to care about and someone who cares about them. We need someone to share with, to laugh with, someone who'll yell at us when we mess up. I smiled and reached out to wipe a tear from Liza's frozen cheek. We need somebody to go to accordion concerts with. Liza sniffed and tried to smile, but couldn't quite manage it. Her face folded in on itself, crumpled into an expression of despair. She turned her head and covered her face with one hand. Evelyn, you're so nice to me. You're just like, you remind me so much of mom. Thank you, Liza. That's probably about the nicest thing anybody's ever said to me. I don't know. Maybe you're right. Maybe I should go back and at least hear what Abigail has to say. But if I do, will you promise me something? She turned back to me, look at me, her eyes earnestly examining my face for a pledge of honesty. I will if I can, I answered. Don't die, Evelyn, don't. I like you so much, really. I know I haven't been very nice to you in the past few weeks. Ever since you told us about your surgery, I, I know it's not your fault, but sometimes I just can't stop myself. I get so mad at you, at Abigail, at everyone, I guess. I'm sorry, Evelyn, I'm so sorry. I know you are, I understand, we all do. 
Liza swallowed hard and nodded, relieved. Good, she said. That's good. Okay. She squared her shoulders and took a step away as if she was ready to, do, to go. Liza, I can't do it, I said. I can't promise you that I won't die. That's the kind of promise that children make. Promises that are really just wishes. And you're not a child anymore, Liza. You know there are some things that no amount of wishing will prevent. And this is one of them. Liza's shoulders sagged again. She looked at me, then back to her mother's grave. I know. I reached out and took her hand. Even though the fabric of her, through the fabric of her black gloves, Liza's fingers felt like ice. I cut my two hands around hers, trying to warn them. Liza, I don't want to die. Your mother didn't want to die either. I'm sure that more than anything in the world, she wanted to live so that she could see what an amazing young woman you're turning out to be. But by the time she found out she was sick, it was just too late. It's not fair, but that's what happened. And it isn't anyone's fault. Sometimes bad things happen, and there's just nothing we can do about it. I know, she repeated sadly, her voice and face registering a weary resignation. I just don't understand why life is so unfair sometimes. Yeah, you and everybody else on the planet. I smiled, but I can promise you one thing. I am going to try absolutely everything I can to beat the stupid cancer and live a long and full life. I've got, if I've got any say about it, I'm going to be around to make quilts to celebrate your wedding and the births of your babies and your baby's babies. So don't you dare give up on me, Liza. I'm feisty. The corners of her mouth twitched into a small smile. I believe it. Well, you better because I mean it. I'm coming at this cancer with both barrels or both boobs or whatever it takes. Liza rolled her eyes at my terrible joke, but that was all right with me. At least she was smiling and I'll need all the help I can get. You know what I'm saying? I'm expecting you to be there, right there beside me the whole way. I will, she said, and squeezed my hand. Promise? Promise. Back in the car, Liza turned the heater on full blast, then stripped off her gloves and held her frozen fingers directly in front of the heat fence. That feels so good. Here, I said, nodding toward her feet. Pull off your boots. I've got a stadium blanket in the back seat. Bring it up here and you can wrap it around your feet. Liza complied and started pulling off her boots and then her socks. Her feet were bright pink with cold. Oh, I clucked. Will you look at that? You're lucky you didn't end up with frostbite. How did you get all the way up to Winthrop anyway? Please tell me you didn't walk through the night in the snow. It has to be at least 20 miles. Liza shook her head. No, when I took off, I walked into town. I realized I really didn't have a plan, but the next thing I knew, I was standing in front of the library. I went to, in to get out of the cold and stayed until closing time. Then I decided I wanted to come up here, so I hitched a ride. A guy with a pickup truck stopped right away and gave me a ride. Of course he did. Liza was gorgeous. Even dressed in her clunky boots and winter jacket, she had a face and figure that could stop traffic and obviously had. Liza, I scolded. You just got in some stranger's car? What were you thinking? She shrugged and said a little sheepishly, well, I wasn't, I guess. It probably wasn't the brightest thing I ever did. The guy seemed really nice at first, gave me a ride as far as Brighton. Then he said he was hungry and would I mind if we stopped at a diner to get something to eat? And I said, sure. He wanted to buy my food, but I wouldn't let him. I had $6 in my pocket. That was smart. You didn't want him to get any ideas. My mother always used to say there's no such thing as a free lunch, if you get what I mean. I gave Liza a sideways glance. Funny, Liza said and raised her eyebrows. My mom used to say that same thing. Well, there you go. Great minds. Yeah, well, this jerk apparently hadn't heard about that particular rule. When we got back in the car, he started trying to get funny with me. Oh, Liza, he didn't. Are you all right? She nodded. There was a trace of a smile on her lips. What did you do? Nothing much. I just picked up his hand off my thigh very slowly and then held it really close to my lips and bit it as hard as I could. Of course, he dumped me out by the side of the road and I had to walk the last six miles, but it was worth it. You should have seen the look on his face. 
She was grinning from ear to ear. Served him right, the big creep. I put my hand over my mouth, trying not to laugh. I knew I should lecture her about the terrible chance she'd taken getting in that car, but instead I replayed the picture in my mind. Liza sitting in the cab of the pickup, gently lifting up the hand of that masher, giving him a sultry glance, and then ever so slowly and sensually taking his fingers, moving them toward her lips while the eyes of that pervert darted from the road to Liza's luscious lips, certain that this was his lucky day, and then crunch. Liza was right. I'd have walked six miles through the snow to see the look on that guy's face. I couldn't help myself. I started laughing, and Liza joined in. She's going to be okay, I thought. It won't be easy, but she's going to get through this thing. Just like her aunt, Liza Burgess was one tough cookie, and I loved her for it. That is all for today, my friends. I hope you are going to have an absolutely wonderful Monday and that you're going to do great and terrific things. And, you know, we're just going to keep our heads and keep our thoughts under control. Um, here is a verse I actually found over the weekend that I thought was pretty, pretty uh, applicable. So this is Psalm 57, verse 1. Be merciful to me, O God, be merciful to me. For my soul trusts in you, and in the shadow of your wings I will make my refuge until these calamities have passed by. My friends, these calamities will pass by. We just got to hang in there. I will see you all tomorrow for the next chapter. I hope you have a good day, my friends.